of Job this last year as I was reading through it, um, I, I would catch myself starting to highlight something that was said or seeing something in there. And um, I would stop and ask myself this question. If you know the story of Job, Job had a really bad day. And three friends showed up that were supposed to be his comforters. And he called them miserable comforters because basically they said, you got all these problems in your life because there's sin in your life. And uh, he said, I really don't think I've done anything wrong. And they said, keep digging. You've done something wrong because bad things are happening to you. And um, as you read through the story, these guys, they, all these things they say about Job, they're constantly ripping him and stuff. And um, you, you kind of get this idea that I would see things and I would think, you know, I'd start to highlight that. I go, wait a minute. One of, the, one of his friends said this. So this might not be true. Just because there's something in the Bible that's written down doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, okay, in the sense that of what they said. Because when you get to Job chapter 42, God finally shows up on the scene. You know, he asked Job all these questions about stuff. And then he looks at these three friends and he uh, says this to them in Job 42 verse 7. After the Lord said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have spoken, have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Basically what God does is he looks at these three guys and he says, listen, I'm ticked at you guys because you said stuff about me that's not true. You said things about me that really, that's not how I feel about things. And so you gotta keep that in mind when you're reading the book of Job, listening to what these guys said. And then God does something really cool. He says, you guys need to make a sacrifice and I'm not gonna forgive you until Job prays for you. Just to rub a little salt in the wound there. You know what I'm talking about? How many wish God would do that with you? Like, if you got a friend that's making fun of you because of your Christianity or something in your life or something, the way you do things, at some point, God would just, you'd like God just to show up and say, hey, listen, you're a dork, all right? And I'm not happy about it, and I'm not going to forgive you until, you know, Sally prays for you. <laughs> just to make you feel a little better about yourself, you know? And that's what he did with these guys. And so, and then God blessed Job, and we all, all know the story. And so, we're this morning, we're talking about some things that people say that, that God didn't really say. A lot of you know, for six years, I was the state youth director here in Oklahoma for the Assemblies of God. That meant every summer, I loaded up all my family, my dogs, and, and we didn't have a cat back then, I don't think. We, I can't remember when we got the cat. I tried to forget about that day. But... Um, <laughs> We would load the whole family up and move down to Turner Falls in Davis, Oklahoma for about six or seven weeks. And so one year we had one of those mornings down there. If you all know Davis, Oklahoma, you ever been down to our camp? Have you been to our camp seen the three crosses up on the hill, right? Okay, we've sold it now, it belongs to Falls Creek, but, and we have a new camp at Sparks. But there's a fault line that runs right across the front of that mountain, which is really awesome if you think about it, because our camp sits below it. And um, we used to uh, have these vans that would park down at the end of the girls' dorms right under those crosses. And so one morning, we had one of those mornings in Oklahoma where it's just really humid. Like if you take your phone outside, it fogs up. Or your camera, you know what I'm talking about? And just everything locks up. And uh, all of a sudden, these people come running into my office. Robbie, Robbie, there's a rock slide. Rocks just slid down the hill and wiped out all the cars. I'm like, what? And so we all go outside and we go down to the end of the girls' dorm. And sure enough, that year before, we'd had a bad fire down there that just kind of wiped out all of the, uh, the underbrush. And then that winter, we had a really bad winter with a lot of rain, freezing rain in that part. And it hit, I guess it got down in the cracks. And when it expanded, um, it, it cracked some of that stuff loose. And so on this morning, several rocks the size of church vans decided to slide down to the hill onto the 20 or so cars that were parked at the bottom of the hill. And literally, we had 11 cars that were, were beat up. About, I think, five or six were totally demolished. There was a church van that was backed into the hill, and it was awesome. There was a rock right behind it standing like this and another rock on top of it forming a timeout sign. But the rock on top was in the back of the van. It pushed the doors of the van in about two feet, but it didn't break either taillight. It hit just perfectly in the middle. It was awesome. And um, there were cars where it had rolled over cars. It was cool. So anyway, I remember calling the insurance company because all these people are mad at me. Youth pastors think they're about to lose their jobs. And uh, I called the insurance company and I asked them about it. Are we covered? Blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, listen, it's not your problem. It was an act of... It was God's fault. <laughs> And so we just had to make sure that they had insurance. God gets blamed for a lot of stuff. People say a lot of things about God. I've heard people say this, cleanliness is next to godliness. It may be true, but it's not in the Bible. It was actually said by Sir Francis Bacon. He's the guy that said that. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. I've heard people say, how many of you have seen pictures of the lion laying down with the lamb in the millennium? You know what I'm talking about? You know, it's not in the Bible. In fact, it says this, the wolf that'll lay down with the lamb, the leopard with the goat, and the calf with the lion. A penny saved is a penny earned. 
God works in mysterious ways. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Young people, that's not in the Bible. Actually, what it says is if your dad doesn't spank you, he doesn't like you. <laughs> it says he hates you, actually. Actually, what the Bible says is the rod will drive the devil out of the child. It does say that. I promise you, it does say that. Um, hate the sin, but love the sinner. That's not in the Bible. It's, it's a good thought. But you know who said that? It's Gandhi. <laughs> we, we get... A lot of things get said to God, and there's one that you may say, well, that's not a big deal. They're, they're, they're insignificant. But the problem is there are some of these things that people say about God that if you really believe them, they can be harmful in your thinking and your concept about God. And one of those is this thing, God wants you to be happy. Now, I'm going to sit here today and tell you God wants you to be miserable, you know, sour grapes and gloom and despair and agony. But I'm just going to tell you God's number one job is not to make you happy. In fact, we're all Americans, right? That's what the American dream is. It's it's life and liberty and what? The pursuit of happiness, right? Some of you that are my age and and, and there, we grew up when Disney was good, wholesome TV. (laughs) And every movie we watched was cartoons and it was before all the new stuff and everything ended when they lived happily ever after, right? In 2014, the most popular song in the world was the song Happy by Pharrell Williams. He's this dude that wears a hat that looks like the guy down at Arby's, okay? And um, it was number one song in 24 countries. And the song says, happy, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. The number one song in the country said that, and our society lives by that idea today, is that happiness is the truth. Or that happiness equals truth because you get to do what you want to do. So this morning I want to give you three reasons why I believe it's not God's job or God's plan. The idea that God wants you to be happy is a myth. The first one is this, is because God doesn't really want you to be happy. God wants you to be content. See, happiness is based on happenings. It's based on the situation that happens right at this moment and what's going on in your life. Happiness is based on happenings. Um, if, If I had this or that, I would be happy is what it says. That's what all the television commercials are telling you, is that if you had a Snuggie, you would be happy, right? Or if if, if you had this cream you could rub on your face and you'd look 10 years longer, you would be happy. You know, if you could lay on the couch and eat potatoes and have an electric ab thing stimulate your ab and give you, you know, washboard abs, you would be happy. If you had a new iPhone and it was on a good network, not like the ones we have here in Mustang, you would be happy. If you had this car or this house or this spouse, you would be happy. It's always based on something. Better possessions plus the right relationships plus the perfect appearance equals happiness. We we have people that have watched too many movies where the man looks at the woman and says, you complete me. (laughs) Can I tell you, there's nobody in the world that can complete you you don't have Jesus, you're not complete. And until you have Jesus, nobody else is a worthy add-on. I'm just going to tell you that. He's the one that completes you. And this is the lie the prodigal son bought into. If I could have all my stuff now, I'd be happy and everything would be fine. And he found out that now doesn't necessarily translate to the end of the story. See, happiness can be a byproduct of living the life God wants you to live, but it's not God's primary purpose in life to make you happy. He wants you to be content. And what contentment means is this. It's just this uh, deep down satisfaction that no matter what you're going through, everything's cool. In Ecclesiastes 7.14, it says, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made one as well as the other. In Philippians 4, Paul speaking here and probably the most misquoted verse in the Bible says this. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or whether I'm hungry, whether I'm in poverty or I'm in, I have plenty. I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's really what that verse says. It doesn't mean you can go out and do anything because God's going to give you strength to do it. That verse says that no matter what you're going through, you can put up with it. You know why? Because you got Jesus. 
That's what contentment is all about. It's this consistency. Paul said in Romans 8, 31, that if God is for me, it doesn't matter who's against me. It doesn't matter if God's for me, if God's on my side. If I have God in my life, I can be content. See, it should not be external circumstances that define your happiness, but it should be an internal strength that gives you a deep down abiding joy. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. See, joy and happiness really comes from having a relationship with God. It's from knowing Him and walking with Him and having a relationship with Him. Well, happy life is dependent on circ- not dependent on, on just cir- or a happy life is dependent on circumstances, but a contented life is dependent on a relationship. It's on knowing him, having a relationship with him, all right? That's what makes, makes it worthwhile. God doesn't necessarily want you pursuing happiness. What he wants is for you to pursue him. Can I say that again? God doesn't want you pursuing happiness. He wants you pursuing him because that's what makes it happy. That's what makes things work. God is the one that you complete me. God completes you. He's the one that makes you happy and satisfies you. The Bible says this in 1 John 2, 15. Don't love the world or all the things in the world because all that's in the world is dying. It's going to go away. It's not going to last. Um, He says all that's in this world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But listen, he that does the will of God is the one that abides forever. So God wants us to have contentment, and contentment comes from a relationship with him and so it doesn't matter on the circumstances what's going on on the outside secondly is this is God wants us to be holy maybe instead of happy see it doesn't is God God doesn't want you to be happy if it leads to sin and most people use it when they say well God wants me to happy be happy usually it's a standalone statement that they say and it really doesn't add anything it usually goes something like this you know my marriage isn't really good and I'm really not sure I married my soulmate. And I'm not happy. And when you talk to your friends, your friends say, well, God wants you to be happy. You can't be God's will that you're in your relationship because you're not happy. And so I've watched people get divorced because they're not happy because they think that that's God's plan is to make them happy. Can I tell you, God says he hates divorce. Okay? If you're here and you're divorced, I, I apologize that you had to go through that. And I believe God can, can make that stuff up in your life. But I'm telling you, it's the wrong excuse to get divorced is that I'm not happy happy. I meet young people that say, well, I'm so happy in this relationship with my boyfriend, and he's been pressuring me to go a little further than maybe we should, you know, physically, and and I'm afraid if I break up with him, or I say no, he'll break up with me, and then I'm not going to be happy, and so maybe it's okay that I, you know, cross the line. God doesn't want you to be happy if it leads to sin. God wants me to be happy. God wants my family to be happy. And so we're going to go on a vacation and we haven't paid our tithes and we'll make it up a little bit later, you know, it'll be okay because God wants us to be happy and we need a break and we need, and God doesn't want you to be happy if it leads to sin. See, the statement that God wants you to be happy above all else is usually the way people mean it. And if that's what you believe, you can justify just about anything. Because it's based on you instead of on God and on God's word. Most of the things that make us happy means it's something that's going to make us happy immediately. But in the future, it's not necessarily really good for us. Like letting your kids eat Cheetos and play video games all day long would make them happy. All right? Might not make you happy when you have little orange smudges on everything in your house. But, you know, that's what they would like, right? Letting your kids eat candy for dinner would make them happy. But it's probably not the best thing to do for them in the future, you know, when they've got diabetes and all kinds of other junk going on. <laughs> Letting your kids stay home from school, would that make you happy? Yeah, it'd make you happy, right? They don't want to go to school. Nobody wants to get up early and all that good stuff, right? But, but, but it's not the best thing for them. I'm amazed how many uh, parents ask us questions like, you know, well, my kids, they got sports and they're tired. They got to do their homework. And so we really can't let them come on Wednesday nights and get them involved in the youth group and missionettes and world rangers. And so we let them stay home. And then when they're 15, 16 years old, and they don't want to live for God. And they don't want to go to church. Their parents don't know what the problem was. Listen to me. You make your kids go to school. You make them go to practices. Make them go to church. Turn to your neighbor and say, I wish the people that needed this were here right now. Go ahead. 
I grew up with a drug problem, man. My parents drugged me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night prayer meeting, Wednesday night Bible study, Thursday night prayer meeting. You know, let me just ask you this. When you don't make your kids do the right thing, who are you trying to really make happy? Maybe you're trying to make yourself happy. The fact is, there's a lot of things that will make you happy right now, but they're not good for you down the road. And God's job isn't to make us happy. God's job is to make us holy. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15 says, Be holy because I'm holy. We're created in the image of God. That's why God wants us to be holy, to be like Him. And when we believe God's primary purpose for us is to make us happy, you know what we do? We make God serve us instead of us serving God. We basically change God into this cosmic bellhop that his job is just helping us get the best parking spaces, get in the line at the restaurant, you know, and uh, our football team win. If that's his job, is just to make us happy, but that's not what it is. We reduce God down to these formulas. Well, if you do A, B, then C is going to happen in your life, you know. And so we have people that come to church, and, and they start coming to church, and they never really dig in. They never really get into this commitment thing. And the next thing you know, that they're out of church because bad things happen in their life. And, and if I serve God, nothing bad's supposed to happen to me. And the next thing you know, they're gone. And they believe this idea that, well, you know, I tried it and it didn't work. Because we've tried to tell them this lie that it's just God's job to make them happy. And, and, and so we reduce God down to this formula. I gave in the offering. I should be happy. I helped my neighbor fix his car. Things should, my life should work out great. I ran over a cat today. You know, my life should be awesome. You know, we, we did the right things. And <laughs> these things are supposed to have, sorry, cat people. But the problem is, is then when we're not happy, so evidently God did something wrong. God failed us, and then we want to quit because we think God didn't do something right. Proverbs 19, 3 says, The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. I read that the other day, and I started reading it in some other versions. In the Message Bible, I love the way it says it. It, um, it says it this way, People ruin their lives by their own stupidity, so why does God always get blamed? The point is, listen. If you think it's God's job to make you happy instead of making you holy, can I just tell you this? It's not jo God's job to conform to my image. It's my job to conform to his image. And that's what this is all about, is about me. People, I've said it before, people don't reject the Bible because it re contradicts itself. They reject the Bible because it contradicts them and the way they want to live their lives. I don't change God to make him fit my desires, I change my desires to fit God's plan for my life. Listen to me this morning. Holiness often requires saying no to something that would make you happy. I'm going to say that again. Holiness often requires you to say no to something that would make you happy. Now, I'm going to tell you, young people, listen. Happiness is uh, not the way to holiness. Holiness is the way to happiness. I believe righteousness is its own reward. And I believe we reap what we sow and happiness is not the way to holiness. Holiness is the way to happiness. So God wants us to be content. He wants us to be holy. And finally, let me say this. I think God wants us to be blessed. And I think there's a difference between blessing and happiness. In fact, the word blessing means more than happy. That's what it means. It means like super happy. Uh, it's something deeper and higher than happiness. In fact, it's more than happy. It's happy, happy, happy. <laughs> we did a series on the Beatitudes, and that's the word it uses, and we called it happy, happy, happy. Because it's a, even a better word might be the word joy. You ever thought about the difference between happiness and joy? There's a difference there. God never commands you in the Bible to be happy, but he does command us to have joy. In fact, the book of Philippians is a book where Paul went, Philippians was a rough city on Paul. It was one of the places he was beaten, like with the, the stripes on his back, even unlawfully because he was a Roman citizen. Him and Paul and Silas were thrown in prison there. All these bad things happened to him at Philippi. And, um, but 18 times in the book of Philippians, the key word in Philippians, anybody know what it is? joy to rejoice Philippians 4 4 rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice because joy is different than happiness happiness is an outward expression joy is an inward contentment James 1 and 2 says it this way my brothers consider it all joy when you fall into trials and tribulations 
Do what? When junk happens in your life, you can still be joyful. You may not be happy, but you can be joyful because there's something deep down on the inside of you because joy is not based on cir circumstances or happenings. In fact, joy sees down the road and sees the good that can come out of it. Because when it says consider it all joy when you fall into tribulations, because it says those will work these things and these things and these things, and eventually you will be complete and mature and lacking nothing. Joy sees down the road. It sees the future, not just the present. Happiness sees right now. Joy sees the future. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Happiness is not. Joy is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit living inside of you and flowing out of your life. And so joy is different. No matter what my circumstances are, I can have the joy of the Lord inside me. And the joy of the Lord is my strength, Nehemiah 8.10 says. So let me just ask you a question. If you had everything the world had to offer you, would you be happy? You would. Solomon had it all. Solomon and... Ecclesiastes said, I, I spared no expense. He's like the dude that started Jurassic Park. I spared no expense. I had it all. I tried everything. I tried relationships. I tried money. I tried booze. I, he says that I had it all. I tried it all. And it was vanity. All was vanity. Let me tell you something. You know why you wouldn't be happy? Because you were not created for this world. You were created for heaven. Some of you need to lower your expectations of this earth. Because this earth can't satisfy you. This earth can't satisfy you because you were created for another world. And I don't care what some preacher says. Your best life is not now. Your best life is later. Because we're not in heaven yet. Am I saying you can't have fun here? Am I saying this life can't be enjoyable? No. We have the kingdom of God now. But folks, this doesn't even compare to what God has in store for us coming down the road. So we're here to bless God. We're here to bless God, the ultimate goal of our life. Look at me, why are we on this earth? We are here for one reason, to bless God, to make God pleased with our lives. Ephesians says we're trying to find what's pleasing to the Lord. The ultimate goal of our lives is not to be happy, but that God would be worshiped and his will would be accomplished in and through us. It's not God's job to make me happy. It's my job to make God happy. And that's what this is about. I don't want you to hear me saying that God wants you to be miserable or doesn't care about your happiness at all. I'm just telling you there's something bigger than that. I love going to football games, and, and every once in a while at a football game, you'll see a receiver coming across the field to catch a ball, and just as soon as it touches his finger, some safety will just, bam, knock the snot out of him. And everybody in the stands is like, oh, that's awesome! And the player jumps up, and he's all excited, and he's happy, and then every once in a while, you get a player that'll stand over the guy, and he'll start taunting him and making fun of him, and you go, oh, man, don't be a jerk about it. You just wiped him out. It's cool. Don't be a jerk. Man. It's like when my kids were, were playing sports growing up. You know, the other day we were watching Maddie and she, this girl was spiking a ball and Maddie jumped up and blocked it and it went straight down and she turned and looked at us and smiled and I thought, oh, that's awesome. It made me happy to see her happy. Now she didn't do this, but if she would have then started talking smack to the girl, I'd have said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, honey, what are you doing? You're not doing that. You know, or, or making gestures to her. You're like, all of, if she did that, all of a sudden there would be something else more important to me than her happiness. And God's the same way with us. It's not that he doesn't want us to be happy, but sometimes there's things that get in our life that God, God's more concerned about those than he is about our happiness. You know why? Because God wants something more for you, something more than happiness. And sometimes in order to accomplish what needs to happen in our lives, God keeps us from happiness. I'm going to say that one more time so you just pay attention. Sometimes in order to accomplish what needs to happen in our lives, we need to be kept from happiness. Because anything that gets between you and your relationship with God, he's going to deal with it. He'll take care of it. So God wants us to bless him, and then he does want to bless us. Don't get me wrong. God wants to bless us. Jude 21 says, stay within the boundaries where God's love can reach you and bless you. Psalm 112, verse 1 says, Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who delight in doing His commands. The Beatitudes all start out with blessed if we do this or that. But did you know a couple of them say this? Blessed if you're poor in, the, in spirit. It means you're broken. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Do what? What are you talking about there? Sometimes God's blessings are disguised as problems. 
See, there's some of you in this room, God blessed you by letting you lose your job. Because what happened is you were neglecting your family anyway and God gave you another job. Maybe you started doing something you never dreamed you'd get to do. But it never would have happened if you hadn't lost your job. There's some of you in this room that God blessed you by letting you get sick. Or bringing something, letting something happen in your family life that, that got your attention. And today you're a believer because through that process you came into a relationship with God. And that was a blessing in your life. Most of us have been through enough trials that we recognize we would never choose them again, but we're who we are today because of the stuff we went through. And God said that in Psalm 119, 75. He said, Lord, I know your commandments are righteousness, and in faithfulness you afflicted me. Look at me. When God lets stuff happen in your life to make you like Jesus, he's being faithful. You know, well, I don't understand that. Because when you came to Christ... What you did is you made a deal with God. You said, I will follow you, and I'll do what you said. And God said, okay, I'll help you become like Jesus. And so through that process, sometimes he does it by a still small voice. Sometimes he yells at you. Sometimes stuff happens that gets your attention and draws you to him. But the overall goal is God's number one desire is not just for you to be happy. He wants to bless you. He wants you to live a holy life, and he wants you to be deep down satisfied and contented in your relationship with him so he can bless you, so you can bless other people. God wants you to be blessed. So again, back to the story of Job. You want to talk about a bad day, read Job chapter 1. All kinds of junk happens in his life. He loses his, his, basically all of his material possessions, his family, his kids get killed. A bunch of stuff happens. A bad day. And in Job 1.21, he says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll return. He says, um, The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He starts worshiping God. And then in Job chapter 2, he starts having physical problems in his body. Boils and big zits. That's like there. The boils are big zits, okay? Just nasty stuff. And all this junk's going on physically in his life. And his wife walks in and says, Why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, you're talking like a stupid woman. He does say that in Job 2.10. He says, you're talking like a stupid woman. And then he says this, shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? Job, through all that, it says he didn't sin. He showed contentment. He showed character. And God blessed him. And then he, in turn, became a blessing to those around him. And his friends said it was because there's sin in your life, Job. That's what the problem is. Everybody look at me. Maybe you're having problems in your life not because you're doing something wrong, but because you're doing something right. If I was the devil and you were doing something wrong, I'd leave you alone. If you start doing something right, I might start messing with you. So if you haven't seen the devil in a while, maybe you need to check which direction you're going. And then finally, you know, God comes down and tells those guys, I'm not going to forgive you because you've been saying things wrong about me. And then he blesses Job. And if you read the story, it's really cool. Job ends up with twice as much as he had at the end. And, and I, as much as I would hate to go through what Job went through, the fact is God had something better for Job at the end of the story. And Job would have missed out on being blessed if he'd have been satisfied with just being happy. And there's some of you in this room this morning that, that you've settled for happiness when God wants to bless you. Because he has something better for you than happiness. It's making us a blessing to himself and being a blessing to others. And that's what God wants for your life. Contentment, holiness, and he wants to bless you and give you a deep down abiding joy. Lord, we thank you that your word is true today. This has been a presentation of The Bridge, a community committed to helping you get to the other side. For more information on The Bridge, you can visit our website www.thebridgeag.org